the Virgin Mary. Throughout the ages, her image has inspired the infirm and the downtrodden to a life of faith. But the true story of Mary of Nazareth may be more heroic, more intriguing than the ancient traditions would suggest. As a young unmarried teenager, she was chosen by God to give birth to a child some would call the Messiah. There clearly were charges that Jesus' mother uh, was of a poor family, that she was an outcast, uh, perhaps even that his birth was illegitimate. Without any special instruction from God, this illiterate teenage girl raised a son who changed the world. I think Mary's role in rearing Jesus must have been the most unique experience that any person on this planet, man or woman, has ever endured or experienced. The turbulent course of Mary's remarkable life, the difficult choices she made, the terrible ordeal she suffered, changed history and transformed the lives of millions for all time. The green hills of northern Galilee. It was here more than 2,000 years ago in a sleepy village called Nazareth, that an infant girl was born. Her elderly Jewish parents named her Mary. Surprisingly, the story of Mary's remarkable birth is found nowhere in the Christian Bible. But an ancient text from the first century that was excluded from the New Testament reveals an intriguing tale of her legendary beginnings. According to this apocryphal legend, Mary's elderly Jewish parents, Anna and Joachim, suffered agonizing grief because Anna was barren and could not conceive a child. In sheer desperation, she prayed unceasingly until an angel appeared offering a remarkable blessing from God. You will conceive and give birth, and your offspring shall be spoken of in the whole inhabited world. Infancy Gospel of James. Nine months later, Anna, who was barren, gave birth to Mary, an event known to millions as the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is the belief that Mary was conceived in a very ordinary physical way, but that she was, when she was conceived, she was never uh, burdened with what we call original sin. Little is known about Mary's earliest years, but it is believed that she was an exceptionally beautiful child. I suspect that if we do think of Mary as a young Jewish girl, most likely we might think of her as a person with darker hair and um, Mediterranean features. Throughout Mary's lifetime, the Holy Land was part of the vast Roman Empire. The occupying army made daily life troublesome for the captive Jews who were forced to live under this stifling tyranny. Mary's community would have been small and closely knit. Her neighbors, simple peasants who toiled long hours on the land in order to survive. Mary's parents would have relied upon her to labor with them.
I imagine that she helped her mother with food preparation, which would have been much more extensive than most of us have ever experienced. If they were farmers, she certainly helped in the planting and harvesting, perhaps even in the preparing of things for market. Learning basic survival skills, cooking, farming, weaving, would have been the most education Mary could ever hope for. In the Middle East of her day, any schooling beyond that was considered a luxury, especially for girls. In fact, Mary herself may have been illiterate. That's not to say definitely that Mary couldn't read or write uh, and couldn't have read scripture on her own, but it's highly unlikely. On the other hand, her memory was probably much better than ours because she didn't rely on the written word. Mary would have found herself caught up in the timeless religious rituals of her Jewish ancestors. Anna would have taught Mary the traditional wifely duties, how to prepare both the Sabbath meal and the more elaborate holiday feasts. Probably in the small town where Mary grew up, there was a synagogue. It doesn't necessarily mean there was a building, but a group of people who gathered together on a regular basis for worship, for prayer, for scripture reading. Religious services connected with family meals would have been a type of learning for Mary. Her mother would have passed on the traditions of Jewish faithful women, faithful to their tradition and to their families. Marriage and family came quickly into the lives of the young Jewish girls of Mary's day. It is even possible that Mary and Joseph had known each other for some time, that they secretly desired to be wed. I'm sure that Mary and Joseph would have respectively have dropped hints to their parents as to which family they'd like to visit and could we have a party together or something like that. And so it was not a loveless match in which the, the, the man and the woman were simply thrown at each other. In the first century, a betrothal was actually a legal contract that was believed to be a sacred covenant between the families. The betrothal arrangement is quite different from what most of us think of as an engagement. It was, in fact, as binding as marriage, perhaps more binding than marriage is among many of us at the end of the 20th century. By the betrothal, Joseph becomes the legal owner, so to speak, to put it rather harshly, of Mary's sexual behavior. For Mary, this engagement to Joseph would mean that her short childhood was at an end. It would mark the beginning of the life she was trained for, to serve Joseph as a loving wife and helper, and most importantly, to bear the sons who would carry on the family name. But as Mary's mother, Anna, and Joseph's mother happily involved themselves in the preparations for the wedding day, Mary violated her betrothal agreement to Joseph. She placed her family in the pathway of an horrendous scandal. But perhaps most frightening of all, when she became pregnant out of wedlock, an act punishable by death, Mary risked her own life and the life of her sacred child. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Luke 1, 26. According to the Gospel of Luke, it was in Nazareth sometime during Mary's engagement to Joseph that she received an incredible visitor. All 
through the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, there are incidents of angels appearing as messengers of God. Now, the actual appearance of a speaking angel anywhere certainly would have been quite an event. And in the humble town of Nazareth, it was certainly an event also. The ancient apocryphal legends revealed that Mary was drawing water from the Nazareth well when the angel Gabriel appeared. Biblical scholars believe that Gabriel's forthright greeting to her, calling her blessed among women, suggested that she was being chosen for an extraordinary experience. But she was more perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Luke 1, 29. Mary was probably incredulous about being even greeted, hail favored one, hail Mary, full of grace. And then to hear this uh, miraculous news, I'm sure she was absolutely stunned, never expecting a role of this uh, magnitude for herself. Oddly, instead of becoming overwhelmed by Gabriel's luminous presence and by the magnitude of his words that she would bear a son out of wedlock, she replied calmly with simple country logic. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? Luke 1, 34. I have never had sexual intercourse. How can I be a mother? And I've always appreciated the fact that Mary was not afraid to ask questions and that this gave us an insight into her uh, and into how, in many ways, she lived her life. Gabriel's answer to Mary's question was astounding. His words marked a turning point in Mary's simple existence as he described a unique, transcendent moment for her that would change forever the course of world history. The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. Luke 1, 35. But did this young girl truly understand the implication contained in Gabriel's prophecy? that she would give birth to a son, even though she was still a virgin. Did she realize that by consenting to this experience, she had placed her loving parents in jeopardy and her own life at risk? Surely Mary knew that the Holy Spirit was the presence of God within the world. And I'm sure she has felt God's intimate presence in her own life and the life of her Jewish community. Therefore, that would not be strange to her. The idea of the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit and making her pregnant would be the startling part. After hearing Gabriel's final words, Mary consented to accept her extraordinary destiny as the will of God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Luke 1, 38. What Gabriel says to Mary uh, is that this is the anticipated Messiah, the one who will inherit the throne of his father, David. The, these are 
very exalted claims about who this child will be. In complete faith, this teenage girl accepted what was a frightening circumstance. Pregnancy in violation of her betrothal vow to Joseph. In ancient times, this was considered a crime, punishable by stoning to death. We can only imagine what Mary might have done uh, following the uh, Annunciation from Gabriel, whether she would have spoken to a member of her family, whether she would have confided in her mother. We simply have to imagine that she met, might have or that she might have been too terrified to do such a thing. Not until three months later, after visiting her cousin Elizabeth, would Mary and Joseph meet again. He obviously notices Mary's pregnancy and is much disturbed by it. He has decided, and the scripture says being a just man, to put away Mary quietly, to divorce her quietly. He legally had an option of publicly disgracing her and even stoning her to death. Joseph would be distraught and even scandalized by Mary's pregnancy. He would certainly know that he was not the child's father and might wonder who was. But according to the scriptures, while Joseph was asleep, an angel intervened on Mary's behalf and appeared to Joseph in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 20. According to an early Christian legend, Joseph awakened from his astonishing dream with a profound change of heart. He gave thanks to the God of Israel for granting him this sacred favor. And he promised to guard the child with his life. Soon after Joseph's dream, he and Mary were secretly wed. But this pious young couple lived in dangerous times. The Roman Empire, ruled by the arrogant Caesar Augustus, made demands upon its subjects. In the ninth month of her pregnancy, Mary and Joseph were forced to travel to Bethlehem, the village of Joseph's birth, so they could be counted in a census. This arduous 80-mile desert journey would take young Mary far from home, placing her on a deadly collision course with the bloodthirsty ruler of ancient Jerusalem. According to the New Testament, after a harrowing desert journey, Mary and Joseph finally arrived in Bethlehem. Joseph feared his teenage bride would soon give birth and searched frantically for lodgings in the small town. But Bethlehem was crowded, and despite his desperate attempts, Joseph was forced to bring Mary to a cave used for sheltering livestock. Ironically, the holy child would be born in a place unfit for human habitation. Caves would have been in the winter time, dark and damp, filled with the humid kind of heavy smells of animals. It certainly would not have been a very pleasant, never mind sterile place to uh, give birth to a baby. Frightened and alone, Mary suffered the pains of childbirth while according to legend, Joseph searched desperately for a midwife to assist her. When he returned with a woman from the village, both stood transfixed as a dark cloud shrouded the cave where Mary was in labor.
suddenly the cloud vanished and a blinding light shimmered from within the cavern. As the radiance dimmed, Mary's baby, Jesus, was born. The scriptures tell us that Mary placed the newborn Jesus in a manger. Experts reveal that this was nothing more than a feeding trough for the animals stabled in the cave. That the birthplace of Jesus must have smelled of moldy hay and manure. It is heartrending to imagine a young mother's anguish. Giving birth under these desperate conditions so many miles from home without family or friends. But it was here in this cave that Mary received her only visitors, shepherds from the nearby Bethlehem Hill Country. In the first century, shepherds were not highly regarded. Uh, they would be sort of the roustabouts, the rowdies of the era. We can only imagine how upsetting, how really frightening this must have been for Mary and Joseph. According to historians, a visit by three wise men came later, sometime after Mary and Joseph had left the cave. This story of wise men uh, from the East probably is a story about how unusual Gentiles, people who are not part of Israel, come to pay their respects. They probably are astrologers, people who are accustomed to reading the heavens and who themselves recognize this amazing event that has taken place. It was during this time that Joseph took Mary and her newborn infant to Jerusalem's holy temple for the traditional purification rites. According to the Bible, a pious man of the temple named Simeon took the infant Jesus in his arms and delivered a frightening prophecy to the simple young country girl who stood before him. This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your heart also. Luke 2, 34. Mary was deeply troubled by Simeon's dark prophecy. But before she had time to consider his strange words, Mary was faced with another more immediate dilemma. King Herod, a vicious ruler installed by the Roman government, received word that a child was born who would be the new Jewish king. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Herod was deeply troubled by this threat to his power. To protect his throne, the king ordered the slaughter of all children under the age of two who lived in or near Bethlehem. According to the scriptures, Mary's husband Joseph had a dream in which an angel of the Lord spoke to him. Get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Matthew 2, 13. Mary and Joseph trusted the word of the angel. They took refuge in Egypt with the newborn Jesus and escaped Herod's slaughter of the innocents, thwarting his evil plan to murder their son. When the Holy Family returned from Egypt, they settled in Nazareth. Joseph resumed his work as a carpenter, 
while Mary raised her remarkable son, Jesus. I think Mary's role in rearing Jesus up to young manhood must have been probably the most unique experience that any person on this planet, man or woman, has ever endured or experienced. It must have been phenomenal for her to realize, according to Christian theology here, that she was rearing God become man, God with us. And how do you handle that? <laughs> One apocryphal legend recounts an inspiring tale in Mary's life as Jesus' mother. When he was six years old, Mary gave Jesus a jug and sent him to the village well for water. But he was jostled as he moved through a crowd of people and the jug was smashed. When he reached the well, Jesus spread out his thin cloth shirt on the ground, filled it with water, and took it home to Mary. When his mother saw the miracle, she kissed him, and she kept to herself the mysteries which she saw him do. Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Over 20 years passed after this remarkable incident. Years which turned from joy to heartache for Mary. Scholars believe that it was during Jesus' teenage years that Joseph died because the Bible simply stopped mentioning him. Her son Jesus began to grow distant from Mary as his unique inner calling to serve God slowly tore him from his mother's life forever. Strangely, it was Mary who compelled him to perform his first public miracle. Mary, Jesus, and his twelve disciples were guests at a large wedding feast in the Galilean village of Cana. At the height of the festivities, the wine ran out, a terrible embarrassment for the host. Mary turned to Jesus and urged him to help hinting, perhaps, that he used his unique gifts. Jesus' reaction to his mother was, at best, indifferent. Some might even say, defiant. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. John 2, 3. Ignoring Jesus' rebuke, Mary turned to the servants, telling them that her son would give them instructions. In a surprising reversal, Jesus obeyed his mother's request. He asked the servants to fill the jars with water, then to give some to the wine steward to sample. As Mary looked on, the incredulous steward made a staggering discovery. The water was now wine. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, he did not know where it came from. John 2, 9. It does seem to say that Mary knew Jesus pretty well. If she was able to say to him, you know, there's a need here, dear. I really think that you should consider this. And then let him take it. And he indeed did fulfill her wish. Biblical experts believe that Mary gradually came to an understanding of her son's extraordinary life and his dedication to his radical beliefs. But in Nazareth, her own village and her son's childhood home, Jesus was an object of shame and ridicule. Some even said he was deranged.
When Jesus visits his hometown in Nazareth, surely Mary hears about the uh, rejection or resentment of the locals. And certainly that must hurt or embarrass her. Sons finally traveled to one of Jesus' outdoor sermons in order to speak with him. When one of the participants sent word to Jesus that they were waiting for him, his response to his mother sounded harsh, even cruel. And pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Matthew 12, 49. In fact, Mary was not mentioned again in the Christian Bible until the day of her son's crucifixion. She was observed at the foot of the cross, a powerful and courageous witness to her own child's agonizing execution. That public association with Jesus would perhaps have been dangerous. The association with a criminal uh, who is being crucified, crucifixion is a, a shameful, shameful uh, death in the Roman world. Uh, th there is a, an element of courage simply in being present and publicly acknowledging him on that occasion.